Good morning. Uh, as Tony said, my name is Dave Chandler. I'm the practice lead for Enterprise Networking Solutions uh, here at Worldwide. And uh, we're going to go through today's software-defined networking. And this is an hour-long presentation that would, it would really probably take uh, a half a day, really, to go through it in any sort of depth. What I'm going to try and do is just give you an overview of where we at Worldwide see SDN today from you know, where it is technologically, where is it on the hype curve, where is, where, what should you be doing about it, if you should be doing anything, um, and exactly where do we think it is right now. Um, before that, I uh, just wanted to give you, uh, I, I've had the opportunity here to give you a shameless plug in the group that, that I work with. And again, we're Enterprise Networking Solutions, and we have uh, several disciplines within this group. So I show this slide because not everybody knows what we do here at Worldwide from an Enterprise Networking position. And if I go ahead and build it out a little bit more, you can see that we cover data center networking. Now, my group does the networking piece of it, so anything that, that does any of the switching or any of the load balancing or the application delivery uh, functionality within the data center is in my group. We also have what I call our meat and potatoes. A lot of people forget these days about the routers and switches that we have in our campus and branch networks. This is still very much a staple of what you all do and certainly of what we do uh, here at Worldwide. Uh, we also have a new group that we started last uh, summer. And this group is handling now high-end routing and uh, optical. So high-end routing and optical would be the, uh, the large service provider, what I call Big Iron. If you're familiar with Cisco, this would be a CRS type of device, or it would be an ASR 9K, and then also optical networking well, so ONSs and things that just deal uh, with fiber and optical. Again, either in a service provider network or we see a lot of this coming into commercial and enterprise customers as well. Uh, dark fiber's back and people are starting to want to light it up with their own gear. Uh, we also have enterprise wireless. And enterprise wireless for us is really a, a merging of two different groups that we had before. One of them is just enterprise wireless. Uh, enterprise wireless is either premise-based wireless, like you see with the, 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 the Cisco, the traditional Cisco wireless products, and then we also do the cloud-based or the cloud controller-based wireless, which is Meraki. So we took that group and we merged them with the group that we were running that did endpoints. So Apple um, is the primary one that we've been working with. We're working with other vendors like Samsung as well, and then we're also putting those two together by engaging software development companies to build the applications that tie those endpoint devices into the wireless infrastructure. And you'll see some demonstrations of that here in the ATC, where we're actually using location services within this building. So if you have your iPhone or if you have your, your phone with you and you're running uh, your Wi-Fi right now, your MAC address will show up on the screen outside and we can track movements throughout the throughout the building. There's a lot of applications for this, but um, different presentation. Um, we also invested about a year and a half ago in software-defined networking. We're very, very early into this field. There's really, for us, um, it was very much of an investment of time and money to understand this technology and what it's going to be. Uh, and then we are also now have several demonstrations that are available within our ATC, and then we also have uh, a number of different workshops that we run with customers to help them dive deeper into this uh, particular topic. But we'll talk, talk a little bit more about the specifics of those at the end. From a lab perspective, we have two lab groups. Uh, one is what I call the seven mad scientists that, that work back in the ATC. They build our demonstrations, they build our sandboxes, they help with the proof of concepts uh, that customers bring to the lab. And then the second lab is, again, brand new, uh, something where we're, we're responding to a number of, of customer requests for us to offload the certification process. So we probably wouldn't end up doing it long term in our ATC in this building, but if there's a need for a customer to do certification for upgrades of software, upgrades of hardware, testing as a service, uh, you know, renting a rack space for customers to come in and do their own certification services. We're starting to do that as well. So that's a relatively new, uh, a new endeavor of, of this particular group. But what we're here today really to talk about is software-defined network. 
And I would imagine, has anybody not heard of the hype of SDN? You know, SDN is probably as hyped as cloud was back in the late 2000s. So we heard about cloud, we heard about cloud long before there was cloud technology. Uh, and we're seeing the same sort of pattern within software-defined networking today as well. So about 2009 uh, was really sort of the introdu introduction of the term SDN. And it's developed through a number of different cycles up to where we are today. So when people talk about SDN and they're asked what it is, you typically get a large number of answers. So I say if you ask 50 people what SDN is, you'll get 52 answers in response. And it's a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It really depends on what you're looking for. It really depends on what field you're in. And probably more importantly, it depends who you've talked to, whether you've talked to a vendor or somebody who's read something in, the, uh, in a trade rag. Uh, but SDN has a lot of different topics. SDN has a lot of different technologies associated with it. And I think up to this point, it's largely misunderstood as well. It's also introduced a number of new acronyms. So just like, just, you know, as if we didn't have enough acronyms to deal with now and new terms, we now have a bunch of others. So we see terms now like OpenFlow. Uh, for a long time, OpenFlow was solely associated with software-defined networking. And back a year and a half ago, if you were to go act, ask some of the academicians at, at Stanford or Berkeley, not Berkeley, Stanford or Wisconsin or Clemson, um, what SDN was all about, they would tell you all about OpenFlow, which is the protocol that really came out of the open source area, and, and uh, again, largely in the academic community, um, and has grown tremendously beyond that now. We'll talk about that a little bit more. You see some other terms in here, APIC, uh, NFV, uh, NSX. Some of these are vendor terms. So what's also happened over the past couple of years is vendors have now gotten involved with SDN. Uh, I think a lot of vendors were surprised when SDN came out. And it took a little bit of time for them to react to it. But most vendors now have an SDN story that they're very, very willing to tell you. And it usually involves some sort of value-add spin that they're going to put on the software-defined networking that makes you look towards their company. Uh, you also hear a lot of other terms around virtualization and virtualized networks and overlays and controllers. We're going to go through a little bit of that today and try and pick this apart. But really, if you look into this tech suit, the really three things that you want to take away from what is SDN is I like the one in the middle. I like network programmability. So for me, the whole point of SDN is to programmatically access your network for management and configuration. And you get a lot of downstream benefits from that. But if you can do it programmatically, meaning have a robot do it, instead of you sit down and type into the command line to all the devices in your network, there's a big distinct advantage there. Also, open networking in that it doesn't matter what vendors you have in your network, the programmability should be able to reach all of them. And to do that, we'll talk about southbound and northbound APIs. And it's also active network, in that active networking allows you to be very, very flexible and make changes very, very quickly. And we'll go back over a number of these topics a little bit later on as well. So first of all, why do we need SDN? What are the drivers behind this? Why do we want to change? Is it simply because someone wrote an article in Network World saying that everybody ought to move to SDN? I think you'll find that even though we like a lot of these technologies and want to go out and play with them, they're really not going to be enabled until there's a business reason for them. So those business reasons really stem, in my mind, along um, a couple of different uh, areas. So if you look at what has driven the need for SDN, I think probably the biggest one is cloud networking. So when I started working in the data center uh, back in the mid-2000s, there was uh, essentially everything was uh, bare metal computing. And the computers did not move around that much, and it was okay to have 
a computer sit in a subnet in a rack forever and ever, never move. Okay, so cloud computing really drove that type of infrastructure towards a much more mobile, much more flexible, much more dynamic environment. So workload mobility was really pushing how we do networking because when they move a workload now, we have to move the network with it. And as you'll see in a little bit, we don't do that very well or haven't been doing that very well over the years. The other thing is video. If you look at how information is consumed today, I think the majority of the people in the room would rather sit down and watch a series of videos than read a bunch of PDFs. I know that I would. I can consume it a lot more easily. It's multimedia in that I can have pictures as well as the voice, as well as dyna dynamic things going on. Uh, but obviously video has a much greater cost to it than does uh, a PDF file. So now you're talking about moving gigabytes of material on a, on a very, very routine basis where it used, to, it used to be a much lower bandwidth. So how do we control, how do we manage, how do we monetize that delivery of video? And also mobility. Probably everybody walked in the room with at least two mobile devices. I just go out here. I think my mic just died. Did it? Very good. Okay, so if you walked into the room with at least two mobile devices, you probably have an iPhone, you probably have a laptop, both of them are wireless devices. Some people come in also with, with uh, uh, tablets. Uh, I know that you know, when I walk into this building, I'm occupying three slots on our APs because I'm always connected in, in multiple ways. And then also the, the new applications that we're seeing, I talked about our enterprise mobility group. If you walk into a number of different retail stores, they can now watch where you're going and they can tell your patterns as you walk through the store and they can readjust where their shelving is to keep you blocked into that store for a longer period of time. They don't have to know who you are, they don't have to know what you bought. They just have to watch that MAC address go through the store and say, boy, there's an easy U-turn out of the store. I want the customer to have more dwell time inside of the store. So I'm going to rearrange the shelving so that they have to take a longer path through the store. So retailers and a number of other industries are starting now to see the value of the, these wireless technologies and these mobile technologies. And then also you're, you're seeing service providers use this to provide entertainment to the handheld devices as well. Once again, you're going to have a large requirement for the network to react quickly to, for example, flash type traffic to mobile devices, and then also react quickly to the needs of, of the retail environments as well. So mobility is also one of the drivers behind software-defined networking. And then the sheer volume of data that we're starting to put a push across the internet. We've always talked about terabytes and petabytes, and now the conversation is around yodabytes. So yodabytes is, it's, I believe, anybody know how, how much a yodabyte is? So a yodabyte is a trillion terabytes. So right now it's estimated that on the internet there's between 14 and 16 yodabytes of storage attached to the internet. And as we start moving that data around, you're going to start seeing, again, the need to be able to redirect circuits to manage this uh, huge amount of information without having to go in and build more infrastructure to handle it. So again, the requirements we have now uh, are really fall into three categories. One is agility. So when we talk about how a business reacts so that it can enter a new market very quickly, that's what we're talking about with agility. So if I am a, I'll go back to retail again, if I'm a uh, department store and you know, Christmas is coming up and there's gonna, I'm gonna have a sale on a particular kind of crap, uh, product and I wanna be able to, that product becomes available very quickly, I can get that product, the faster I get it to the market, the more money I'm gonna make on that. The longer it takes to me to get it to market, the longer it sits in the warehouse and the less opportunity I have. So again, agility and speed are very, very important. 
Simplicity is another advantage to that, that, that drives STN as well. So right now, if we wanted to make that change, to bring up that website, to support that retail application, we would have to go in and spend an awful lot of time figuring out how we need to change the network, probably across multiple different networks, multiple devices, and we'd have to handle them individually. So the idea of, re of reducing that operational complexity will it is a result of making that network simpler to operate. But one of the things you have to remember is simplicity is not simple. So uh, the, the, the example that I give around this is, is fairly simple. It's the, the automatic transmission versus the manual transmission. If you think about an automatic transmission, it's relatively easy to build. But it's a little bit more difficult to drive. You have to sit there and shift the gears and coordinate the clutch and, have, and decide what gear you need to be in as the car speeds up or slows down. So that is something that is simple to build, but relatively difficult to operate. An automatic transmission is, is different. If you've ever taken one of those things apart, there are zillions of parts in it, probably have no idea what they do. But at the end of the day, it's very, very simple to drive. I can go into an automatic transmission, a car with an automatic transmission, I put it in drive, I press the gas pedal, that's all I have to know. I don't have to know, have to know about shifting or speed or when to push in the clutch. It's already done for me. So the, the idea of software-defined networking is to make that operational function a very simple thing to do. But the fact of the matter is, is since simplicity is not simple, someone is going to have to deal with the complexity of that. And this is where we get into the whole aspect of automation. If I can build it once, and I can make it a programmatic process that can be applied across a whole network simultaneously, then the fact or the act of changing my QoS or the act of updating my access control list becomes very simple if it's done in a programmatic, automated, <laughs> and then finally, the business value of software-defined network. So the business value is really to monetize the network. The great examples of this are in the service provider space. So let's say uh, Tony doesn't hand out tickets to the cards game tonight, but everybody wants to watch it, but they have to look at it on a mobile device, and they don't have enough bandwidth going to their mobile device. So what the service provider might be able to do is say, okay, so here's what, if you swipe your credit card and give me an extra $20, I'll give you additional bandwidth so that you can watch the card game, cards game tonight at high definition. And then after the game, you go back to your normal rate. So that's a great example of how service providers can monetize these networks to use their existing infrastructure, provide a customer with more services, and be able to monetize those services that they're providing to the customer. Again, it's, it's tied to agility, it's tied to the simplicity, it's tied to the automation as well. So what have we been building so far today? I assume every, most of the people in the room have been in networking for some period of time. And we know a lot of networks that look like this. So it's redundant, multiple paths, using a number of different uh, technologies to make sure that I can get a packet from point A to point B, B and if something breaks and something's going to take over and, and, uh, and, and still provide that redundancy. And so I also equate that type of networking to Stonehenge. So this is what we have been taught to build for a number of years. It should be stable, it should be rock solid, and it should be fixed. And we've done a very, very good job of this. The problem is, is that the business drivers that are out there today make this an archaic structure because it's not flexible, it's not mobile. I can't redefine this uh, very, very quickly. So what we have been building now because of business drivers, not necessarily because of technology drivers, has to change. So we'll poke a little bit of fun at the network folks. Um, if you look at evolution of technology, and I'll go back to the cloud technology right now. Uh, when, back in 2005, if you ask somebody, how many of your servers in your data center are virtualized, there'd be very few. 
VMware essentially at that time was something relegated to a lab. Between 2005 and today, the compute folks and the storage folks have evolved from bare metal to virtualization through automation, orchestration, and they're now building clouds. Remember we talked at the, talked very, uh, at the beginning about the hype cycle around cloud computing. Well, that actually came true, and probably to the expectations of, of the, you know, the early adopters were of the hype cycle that was out there in, in the mid-2000s. We actually do have clouds. People make money off of them. They're building them privately. They're, there's now public clouds. We're now starting to change workloads or, or move, move workloads between private and public clouds. They did a pretty good job of evolving from that bare metal environment to the cloud environment we see today. So how do we do in networking and networking services? Probably not so much. Okay. I put 1992 up in the there because that's when I started doing networking. And I had um, a Calpana switch with serial number two on it. And I managed that switch through a command line interface. And when I, uh, uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> when, nowadays, we, even when you're working with things like Nexus 7000s, um, you're also working with a command line interface. And you're working with one box at a time. The only way we've really evolved from a management and a deployment method is we now in encrypt that command line protocol. And if you think about it, that's all we've done in the past 20 or 30 years from a network management and a network deployment perspective. Everybody agree with that? People who, who you still use a CLI today? Probably everybody in the room that doesn't. Okay. So the hard fact is that despite advances in the hardware, you think about that Calpana switch, what it was now versus something like the Nexus 7000, Despite those advances in technology and in ASICs and even in network operating systems, the way we build and manage and deploy networks is significantly behind the cloud and the storage folks in two ways that really matter, agility and mobility. Now, agility and mobility are not technical terms. Agility and mobility are business needs, business drivers behind this. So, we we'll look at this two ways. We got a problem or we got an opportunity. And so I'm going to step back here for a minute, though, and, and look at some of the definitions that we have here, some of the underpin, under underpinnings and some of the things that people attach to software-defined networking are often intermixed and often uh, not defined correctly. So I'm going to quickly go through a series of definitions here on network virtualization and virtualized network. Just take a minute, but I think it'll, it helps set the stage for when we start talking about what SDN really is. So first of all, network virtualization. Network virtualization has been around since 1992. So we started talking about network switches instead of network hubs. We started talking about VLANs, and we started talking about network virtualization. So it's been around for a long time, and then we've also virtualized a lot of other things. So think about a VRF, virtual routing and forwarding to main for layer three. Think about how MPLS works with tagging. You think about VPNs as an encapsulation or a virtualization of a private network over a public one. So there's a lot of ways that we've gone ahead and done virtualization. We've even virtualized devices so if you look at something like a, a Cisco ASA or a, or a Nexus 7000, again, we can chop that box into multiple virtual devices used on device context. So network virtualization has been around for a long time and is not really a new term. But again, it's associated often with a software-defined network. You talk about virtualized networking, you're typically talking about virtualized switch. So when hypervisors first came out, when VMware came out, when KVM came out, when Hyper-V came out, because we had multiple workloads within a single physical device, 
then we had to have some mechanism to be able to switch packets between those virtual devices and between those virtual devices in the outside world. So built into the hypervisor, unknown to many of the network administrators, were one or more switches that did exactly that. So virtual switching has probably been around since 2005, 2006 as well. It's evolved tremendously. When it first came out in VMware, it was a simple, almost hub-like virtual switch. It did not have a whole lot of functionality. It was built entirely within the hypervisor. There was no, real, no way to really manage it or monitor it from the outside. So it was an entity that belonged entirely to the VMware administrators. And over the course of the past couple of years, we've now seen what are called virtual distributed switches. And the virtual distributed switches help by taking that control plane and putting it in the hands of the network administrator while still having that forwarding plane within the hypervisor itself. So virtual switches have been around for a while. And if you look a little bit uh, as, at how they work, I'll use the VMware e switch as an example of an older, uh, simple switch, which is a good thing in many cases. But at the same time, it has the problem that I can't monitor it very well and it has to be managed by the VMware administrator. So if you now move forward, if you look at, for example, the Nexus 1000V, that changed because, and this is key here, especially when we get into software-defined networking, we separated the control plane from the forwarding plane. The control plane is now, there is no longer intimately attached to the forwarding plane. I can now, from a distance, tell that switch how to forward flows and how to move traffic through a network. So it's a very key thing because when we start talking about open flow and software-defined networking, this is one of the basic tenets. And so on top of that, you would have, um, let me back up one here, uh, down here at the bottom, uh, you see that we have a, what's called a VSM, a virtual supervisor module. And it's pretty much exactly that. A VSM is a supervisor that can be located pretty much anywhere you want it to be within a network. But, but it's going to go in and control all the forwarding planes that are inside of all the different hypervisors that are inside of your network or inside of your virtual network. So a single point of control over multiple forwarding engines that gives me a global view across my whole uh, virtual switching environment. And again, that, that concept is something that you should remember because it is, again, one of the basic tenets of, of software-defined networking. So network abstraction uh, is another thing that's been, another term that's been in software-defined networking. And network abstraction is a little bit more interesting because we're now starting to talk essentially about multiple networks. We're talking, uh, we refer to it as a tale of two networks. When you talk about network abstraction and overlay networks, there's an implication that there is a virtual overlay network that rides on top of a physical underlay network. So a lot of the products that are out there today, the ACI and the NSX that you're seeing from the different vendors, they're very simple to deploy and operate because they're taking advantage of, of building a overlay network that solves their business needs on top of the underlay network that may or may not do that same thing. So overlay networks um, come in a number of different forms. There's a number of different technologies that can be described as an overlay network, but they all do, do that overlay process through encapsulation. So if I take a native packet and I stick it inside of another packet, I send it to a location, and I strip off that outer packet, I'm now left with the native packet format at my new location, but I've transited a network that may or may not be contiguous to the overlay network to get there. Does that make sense? So a number of things that do this is way back when we did it with generic router encapsulation, the GRE. Been doing that for years and years and years. That down at the bottom of this list, probably the most talked about one that we hear about today is VXLAN. 
So VXLAN is an overlay technology that allows me to extend layer two networks across a layer three infrastructure. And not really care too much what the underlay, uh, uh, the underlay network looks like other than it has to work. And then it'll come in really two different flavors. One is layer two encapsulation, and the other one's layer three. So layer two overlays are things like VXLAN, uh, NVGRE, uh, OTB. Layer three encapsulations are things like VPN, GRE, and LISP, if, you, if you're familiar with the, the LISP routing protocol. But once again, this is uh, one of the basic tenets that VMware is using, that uh, Cisco is using, uh, pretty much in the data center space to say, I can now connect devices together by abstracting the underlay into an overlay that fits my needs. Okay? And now let's talk a little bit about software-defined networking. So if we reset a little bit, where are we today? What are we looking at today? Well, we're talking about devices that are Networks that are defined by the box. Each box has separate pro uh, po mm. each box has separate policies. Yeah, there are distributed algorithms that allow these boxes to talk together. Routing protocols, things like spanning tree protocols, different protocols that allow the different boxes to be able to talk to each other. But they are federated systems, and all of this was really derived from the introduction of ARPANET from back in the 80s. <coughs> so the story that's always a good one to tell is ARPANET was a defense network, and the whole idea behind making it very redundant was is if there was a nuclear attack at, say, in Washington, D.C., then the network that was in Colorado would survive. And while that's, got, that's a great story to tell, it's not true. Um, the reality behind it is that back in the 80s, if you think about how well the, a, a circuit worked, how reliable was that circuit from a service provider, or how was reliable was a networking device, neither one of them had a, what I would call, exceptionally high rate of reliability. So what they did is they built the network out of autonomous systems that were interconnected or federated together by these protocols. So if we did have a circuit that went down, or if we did have a box that broke, the network knew how to redistribute itself or redistribute the traffic to get around the part that was broken. And that really set the stage for how we've been doing networks for the next 30 years. And now it's really, the software-defined networking is basically saying it's time to change because although there are those advantages to that autonomous system, those autonomous systems, there are distinct disadvantages, again, in the, in the areas of mobility and agility. So here's our traditional networking. Those little CPs are control planes. You can see they're intimately attached to the devices that are, are called the forwarding planes. So a router or a switch you buy today you know, has the ASICs, has the port, has the operating system that's running some sort of network operating system that usually has some protocol that allows it to recognize the boxes that are around it. So we're all very, very familiar with that. But we moved into software-defined networking. We wanted to we wanted to be able to dissociate that control plane from the forwarding plane. But this is really broken up into two different approaches to SDN, and I mentioned this before. The first one I refer to as the purest view, and the other one is a hybrid view. The purest view is the one that came out of the academics. It's the, uh, essentially the single concept of open flow driving the whole network. A single controller in the sky with a single protocol talking down to the, to the forwarding engines. Um, and while that is what I'll call sort of high in the sky and it would be great if that's the world was, um, it's not really the way that we operate. And the vendors also started getting involved and in saying, you know what, we have a whole lot of investment, we have a whole lot of technology that we'd like to be able to use in the software defined process as well. So you saw the introduction of what we call the hybrid approach. And that basically means that instead of just having open flow as that mechanism for a controller to talk to an end device, 
I can have also have a lot of the more traditional protocols that I've been using so far. So CLI is back, SNMP is back. Vendor-specific APIs can be used. So now the controller, or the device that, that's actually programming these switches, can use multiple protocols to talk to all the boxes in the network so that I can retain a lot of the investment that I had uh, in there before. Now, this is very interesting because for me, it allows us as a networking community to adopt software-defined networking much faster. If you take the purest view, you gotta buy SDN capable boxes or open flow capable boxes. You have to change the way you operate. And it would be a very, very long process to go through that. If I take the hybrid approach and I don't have to change out that firmware, I can continue to use processes that are familiar to me, but I can automate them. Now that suddenly becomes much more attractive and I'm much more willing to move forward in the SDN process. So the purest view is simply the decoupling of the control plane from the folding plane. And here's what that would look like. I have a controller or controllers that sit centrally in the network. Again, the advantage here is if I have a process where if I can see what the whole network looked like when I want to deploy something, um, this would be a great advantage to that. A uh, good example is quality of service. You can figure put quality of service box by box throughout the network, and you miss the box in the middle. What happens to your quality of service? It's dead. But if I have a global view of the whole network, and I can look at a hop by hop flow, and how QoS has been applied, being applied to those packets throughout the entire flow in a single pane of glass, then it's a much more effective way of doing it. Another example, simple process we all use day in and day out is access control list. Again, if I don't have the access control list distributed entirely or globally in my network, it's not going to work. Something where I have a, a controller that has, again, the global view of the network, and I can look how that access control list is distributed from one end to the other in the network, in a single pane of glass, I have a distinct advantage. And this is where you're going to see a lot of the software-defined networking applications start, is in places like this. So I've talked about a couple of different parts of software-defined networking. Uh, probably the three that are the most important here are the controller itself. Uh, controller is generally software. It's usually a virtual machine. It's usually written in something like Linux. Uh, controllers can either be purchased through vendors, or controllers can be uh, just downloaded off of an open source site. And I think I have a couple of examples of what these controllers are. But they generally fit into two different categories. One that is purely SCM, or one that's purely open flow, and another one that is what we call open daylight, or a hybrid controller. We also have agents. Agents is the little chunk of software that sits down on a switch that allows itself to be controlled by a controller. So you need something on the switch that a controller can talk to because remember, the controller is telling that forwarding engine how to behave, how to forward packets. So there has to be something on the switch that allows it to receive that information. And then the third thing is what's called an API. And an API already exists in most of the things that you're working on today. So if you look at a Cisco switch and you go to a command line and you type into a, a type in a command, that command is actually talking to an API in that, in that switch. And the way I'm accessing that, a, that API is through the command line interface. Well, in, in software-defined networking, one of the things that we can start doing is directly accessing those APIs and from a controller and not having to not have to go through the command line interface. So you have a choice now. And especially when you get into hybrid networking of first of all, the controller is probably the staple, the agent is built into these switches. And what APIs you can access is what are the things that you can control inside of that forwarding plane. 
Control planning forward and claim separation isn't new. How many people did SCLC? How many people were in the mainframe? Okay. So, yeah, we already did that. Okay. How many people have used PFR? Uh, Cisco's PFR. Okay. Same concept. I have a controller and I have, and I have uh, uh, other devices that listen to that controller. And probably the biggest one that we, we all probably use, how many people run a wireless network and use LAN controllers or use WAN controllers in the network? Same concept to think about. And it's a good parallel here because when wireless networking first came out, we would put all these autonomous access points out and we'd have to go configure each one. We'd configure the SSID in it, we'd configure the, you know, the web key in it. Uh, I'm going to take myself back there a little bit. Um, we, all these things would be individually managed. And then you saw these controllers came out where well, I'm going to take this controller and put it in a central location. I'm going to make the access points dumb. I'm going to put an agent on them that's going to allow that controller to come and talk to it and do the configuration and collect the statistics. And now I can start seeing things when someone roams from one access point to another I can go to that centralized controller and I can see that happen because I have a global new global view of the wireless network. Doesn't this sound an awful lot like what I've been talking about for the past 40 minutes? Is a global view of the network where a controller goes ahead and does the configuration and manages those devices. So open uh, floodlight and open daylight are good examples of uh, controllers and the floodlight controller is a controller that is a open flow only controller where open daylight controllers are controllers that are a product of the consortium of a number of different companies that, net, that wanted to permit more than just open flow as a southbound API. And this is what an open daylight controller looks like conceptually. Really, the key is down here. So, you know, you essentially have the northbound API, which is relatively simple. It's HTML5 that allows you to talk back to other uh, applications. You have the, the controller platform itself. And then down here is you have the, the different protocols that you can use to talk to the switches, the routers, the access points, whatever you want to put into the software defined network. Okay? The open daylight controller has multiple options down here where just a, a, um, a the floodlight controller just has a single cap uh, capability for that. So this is what it looks like today. So the strict se se separation of just open flow is now combined with applications and API centric capabilities. And then we're also going to take that notion of network overlays. Remember the overlay and underlay network, specifically VXLAN, and we're going to add it to this definition. And now the term SEN is really a sum of all those different parts that a couple of months ago were really separate. So this is a little bit of what the evolution of SDN is. So a number of key players are startups. Um, you're already starting to, you're starting to see the buying wars begin. If you looked at the you know, network world, I think um, Cisco announced that they were going to be buying Tail F, which is a SDN company that's one of the early startups that's been out there for quite a while. And Tail F is really a company that, that specializes. A lot of these little startups are specializing in a particular area. So Tail F was working uh, a lot with the service providers to use really an older protocol called NetConf to do the configuration of devices in a service provider network. Um, you also see a number of other companies that, uh, you know, Juniper and Contrail. Um, so there's a lot of buying going on to try and leverage where they can have a very, very fast gain in a particular technology or a particular area of SDN. Uh, so these are number of the uh, vendors that are out there today. So, if I come back and, and give you a new definition of SDN, uh, this is probably the best one that I, that I can come up with or we can come up with. And really, it's a flexible programmatic framework to optimize the delivery 
and then management of network services. It's largely driven by cost, by the hyperscale that we're seeing in data centers today, and also by the dynamic consumption of these services that are coming out of, of either business uh, solutions or from the data center itself. So again, it's a lot of this is agility and mobility. But again, if you look at this, as it's a large framework. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. There's a lot of different parts to it. So I put this slide up here because we get a number of people say, say, I want to I want to start doing SDN. And I say, great, what do you want to do? I don't know. OK, I'm not sure that you want to start doing SDN. So what you really need to find to start moving forward with SDN is a use case for it. What can SDN do for you better than what you can do today by more traditional networking methods? Because if you think about everything that I said here, the APIs are really being accessed by the, by the CLI now. SDN allows you to access those APIs. The APIs haven't really changed, just how I access and how I use them. So the question should really be, can SDN help me do something today faster than the way I'm doing it today? So um, you know, I'll show you some of the examples that we've come up with. But you can't go to a store and buy a shrink wrap box of SDN. SDN, again, is that, that, uh, that tool set, that number of different processes number of different APIs, number of different programs, number of different companies that you can go to for that. If you ask people when and where they're going to deploy it, you can see that the, I put this up because really the primary area that we see today is data center. And data center is always a great spot for new technologies because it's this enclosed little box. And you know, there's no lands, there's no lands, it's just a box and very little things extend beyond that box other than the traffic in and out of it. So the data center is usually a perfect place to, to enable new technologies like this, and you see a lot of benefit for it. But you also see branch and campus. The whole QoS, ACL, those are great targets for that. Uh, there's a number of things that you can do out in the WAN with SDN. Uh, black hole routing, being able to redirect traffic over more optimized circuits. You know, PFR can do that, but can SDN do it better than PFR? Again, it's that sort of question. And here's the old Gartner height curve. So where I think we are right now, uh, somewhere between the deception zone and the trough of delusionment. So all the hype came out uh, a couple years ago. Last year, we were up here talking about, uh, literally, people were talking about SDN will be the end of Cisco. SDN will be the end of Juniper. SDN's going to bring all those companies down. and. Then customers would sit there and say, great, how are we going to do that? The answer was, well, we're still working on that. All right? So I think that that's sort of the delusion that, that we have out there. But out of this trough of delusion, it actually starts coming viable, usable use cases, and we're starting to see them now. So SDN can also be really in two forms right now. What, something that I call something you buy versus something that you build. You can go out today, or very shortly, you can buy Cisco ACL, you can buy VMware NSX, you can buy Big Switch. So what that is, is essentially uh, SDN processes, programs, applications that have been built for you and packaged inside of that vendor's controller. You can buy that today, install it, and operate it. And it gives you a basic level of activity. Uh, within that SDN environment for you to operate. Then you can also go into something you build. Uh, and, and we actually have a number of different uh, programs going on within Worldwide for our own engineers to help them understand that they're going to have to be a little bit of a programmer if they're going to be a network engineer. And with that knowledge of networking and with that knowledge of programming, you can now start building SDN applications that can optimize and accelerate how you manage and how you deploy networks as well. And then there's the combination of the two as well. So Worldwide, 
Uh, and I'm going to stop on the slide and give you the opportunity here to ask questions. But at Worldwide, again, we've been doing this for about a year and a half. We've done about 50 SEM workshops for our customers. And that's taking this concept and this conversation that we're having right now and extending it out to probably a four hour time frame. We really get down into a lot of the detail around some of this. Uh, and then we've also built several labs inside of our ATC. So we have labs that, for example, use SDN controllers to tap data into analytic devices. Or we have, uh, uh, we also have a, the, the applications that will do a global deployment and, and qualification of QoS. And then, so a lot of these things are out there. We're running a number of them in the lab today. Uh, I'll go back to the Cheshire Cat thing. You know, you really need to understand where SDN can help you, what those applications are, and then start working towards deploying an SDN application specifically for that use case. And with that, I'll go ahead. One of the questions we get, and we want you guys to ask questions, is this is software by networking is it's fairly new, right? I'm still making a lot of networking decisions. I'm still interested in looking at software by networking. What do I do today? so that I don't have a gotcha later where I have to just throw something away that I might have purchased? What steps can I do to start the foundation outside of maybe looking for a use case and really set the foundation for the future? So, so the use cases I've described before, if, if you're looking for an SDN, app, uh, SDN application that's only going to impact one box, it's probably not worth doing. It. So you want to look at something for SDN that really involves a system or a number of different devices within a network uh, infrastructure. So again, I'll go back to the QoS, I'll go back to the ACL. Those are easy slam dunks to work with. Another thing that's an, an easy one to do is if you want to tap data, for example, off of an inbound circuit into some sort of analytic device, whether it's a sniffer or a snort, you can, and, and you're limited by the number of span ports, for example, you have on a switch. Again, it's another very easy and well-established use case for SDN. I think the way open daylight controllers are working right now, there there's really is less risk of what you buy because the southbound APIs um, like CLI and SMP are now permitting you to use what you have today. So your investment is really in the controller and the, the intellectual investment is figuring out for your particular case, what a use, good use case would be to start using SDN. Great. Another question I have is, you know, so I, we have roughly 50 pre sales engineers that I manage throughout. One of the things that we're starting to see is the skill sets of not only software-defined networking, but software-defined everything. What skill sets are the networking folks having to add to their their backgrounds to make them viable when it comes to the software by networking discussion. Okay. Um, so we consider ourselves to be what we call net ops people or network operations. We understand routing, switching, protocols, speeds and feeds. You know, that's a great skill to have. Um, SDN really adds to that what we refer to as DevOps. And DevOps is development. And so some sort of programming language is certainly a nice to have. Probably the, the target that everybody is going for right now is a scripting capability. And the most often scripting language we see today is Python. So within Worldwide, we're actually, we're actually offering Python scripting for network engineers to our internal SEs and, and professional services folks. And that, I think anybody you ask, if you're going to do the build it yourself, then Python scripting is essential. Great. Does anybody have a question in the audience? Anybody? Where do you see like a chef and puppet coming in play? Uh, the chef and puppet, and what, I, I had it in a slide, but I didn't talk about it very much. Another aspect of SDN is not just the uh, access to the APIs. But a lot of the operating systems that are out there, the newer operating systems that are, are coming into the network space, have the capability for Chef and Puppet. 
And for those of you who don't know what Chef and Puppet is, is those are our common languages that you can use for essentially programming and monitoring devices. As you know, if you think of what they're called, Chef and Puppet, it's uh, you know, basically I can go in and I can actually use those commands for configuration uh, across the network operating system at the network operating system level. So most of the vendors didn't let you get that far down into their operating systems before. And with Chef and Puppet, and some of them even have bash capabilities now, you can go into a, a much more rudimentary level and actually do that programming on the box itself, again, either from a controller or from an application. So a lot of them have that, and it's definitely a part of the, what I'll call the Southbound API tool set. Any other questions? I'm sure other companies that are doing this well. In other words, I think Google obviously is probably doing well. Um, I guess Amazon and folks providing service providers out there, local companies that are doing SD and well that you can speak about. Well, the, a lot of the companies you've mentioned, the Googles, the Amazons, the, they're, they're in a class by themselves, and they're very definitely in the build-it-yourself category, yeah. and have been for a long time. If you think about those companies, they've been scripting for a very, very long time, and for them, this is great, because now there's more attention to um, uh, vendors opening up those APIs, or you know, even uh, uh, you know, the, the programming capabilities that they have have been expanded as well, just because of the visibility of STM. So those companies really do a lot of their own work and have been for a long time. Got gotcha. you. Yeah, I just do. It just makes me wonder. You know, limited staffs, um, busy people. Um, you know, sitting down and, and learning Python is great, but then having to also you know, create scripts that back into orchestration to APIs. It sounds like a long road of running. Uh, it sounds more like you're, you're going to be, the expectation will be for your providers of infrastructure to provide those APIs that will interface and to allow for that orchestration. You know, uh, you know, if you have a huge staff and you have loads of money, that sounds like maybe a, a, a DevOps sounds like a really good way to go. But I, I just don't see how that's going to work. So, so I see really, uh, there's three things I thought about when you were asking that, and one is that you're exactly right. To, to go to the typical overworked uh, networking group and say, okay, everybody go out and learn Chef or Puppet or Python or something, something like that, and we're going to start scripting our network. Um, yeah, yeah, probably a lot of headache for the door looking for somewhere else to go. Uh, and that's really where the, the vendors now are starting <coughs> to come out with these, you know, remember to buy it or build it? You can go ahead and buy something where that's already been done for you. The advantage is, is all those hooks are still there, so if someday you do want to go beyond the capability that the native GUI gives you, you can do that. Okay? And I also believe that we're, there's still several more iterations of SDN programming to come, and one is compiling or creating objects that are much easier for uh, a company that doesn't have those programming skills to use. So, about libraries. yeah, libraries. You know, basically, you know, I always said if I, Jim's still here. So I would told Jim Cavanaugh if I had any guts, I'd go out and start my own business, and I would just start building SDN libraries and components that I could turn around and sell, um, either back into companies that are writing software or back into the OEMs as well. But yeah, absolutely good point. And that's why we really come up with the build or buy, or you either build it or you buy it. And again, the advantage of buying it is you can buy it and use it, and if you get those skills and those capabilities later on, there's lots of things that you can do to interface that into other processes as well. So that's really, really the anchor we can talk about over the world, the open stack. Yeah. That's the anchor. Yep. Uh, and OpenStack and OpenFlow were often thought to be the same thing. They're obviously very right. different things. Um, and I think that there's a lot more discussion, in my mind, especially over the past six months, about the interaction of software-defined networking and OpenStack. Other questions? Okay.